Jeff, you said recently that the establishment of Beyond Blue in terms of a legacy was something you consider far more important than anything you or your government did during the, the seven years you were in office. I don't see it as a legacy, but when talking about my life, uh, I consider the work of Beyond Blue outside of family to be the most important thing I've done to date. My daughter came to me in 1997 after two of her friends had died in totally unrelated car accidents and she was understandably very upset. And she said to me, who was Premier at the time and a person with some influence, what can you do to stop these young men dying on the roads? And I thought, and I think she thought at the time, that we were talking about lowering the road toll. But when we learnt more about these deaths, we found that both were uh, young men who had been separated from their girlfriends, uh, were very emotionally depressed and had used alcohol to take their lives. So they were suicides. So that meant it wasn't so much about reducing the road toll, it was actually about trying to better understand what causes people to take their lives and that led us down this path towards depressive illnesses. Dee, you're a major voice in mental health in Australia and you play two fairly diverse roles. I do play two um, diverse roles. The first role that I play is, and the part that's very important to my heart and a passion, is advocacy for people with mental health issues. So there's those that are living with mental health issues. There's also those people who love and care for people with mental health issues. So that advocacy work is working at a national level with policies, systems, major government groups and others. So I represent at a national level. Um, part of the blue, uh, Beyond Blue, Blue Voices work that I do. Suicide Prevention Australia said recently that nearly all suicides could have been prevented. What's What's inhibiting that prevention? Oh, it's a complex question. And in my very limited but uh, very uh, heartfelt experience, I think that it's essentially a few things. I think that we need to take away some of the stigma. I think we need to take away some of the discrimination that still goes with uh, suicide. I think that we also need to equip family, friends, others, professionals, in how to identify early warning signs and how to have some of the hardest conversations that they're ever going to have to have in their life. You've been quoted as saying, Jeff, eliminate discrimination and you reduce depression and you therefore cut the suicide rate. When you talk about discrimination, are you talking about racial, sexual, cultural or environmental? It can be all of those things. It won't eliminate suicide because there will always be some people who will opt out. There will be some people who, when emotionally depressed, such as the two young men whose deaths led to the foundation of Beyond Blue that I discussed with you a few moments ago, uh, who, when emotionally depressed, when suffering from alcohol, which is the greatest mind-changing product of all, or drugs, uh, get themselves into such a state that they believe the world is better off without them. That is never the case, but they often believe that. Uh, but for some, uh, discrimination plays a very major role in their lives. So if you take the uh, GLBTI community, gay, lesbian community, their suicide rate per capita is higher than any other group. Not because they're gay, but because of the discrimination that is shown against them and therefore discrimination is still a terribly influential factor in the way in which people feel and the way in which people behave and then in many cases the way they take their lives. You've talked quite extensively about clinical and emotional depression. This is obviously something that a lot of people don't understand, in, at least in terms of the difference between the two. No, but we should understand it. Emotional depression is when you get upset, uh, normally for a short period of time. It might be the separation from a partner. It might be financial issues. It might be a health issue. In most cases, people recover from emotional depression. Clinical depression is where you suffer three or four ingredients for a period of three or four weeks, and that's an indication that you are suffering a clinical depression. What might those factors be? They might include uh, your eating habits change, you can't sleep at night, you find yourself withdrawing from the community, 
you lose confidence in yourself. There's about 14 ingredients that are on our website, www.beyondblue.org.au, that outline those ingredients which, if present for a period of time, can be an indicator that you're starting to suffer from clinical depression. So emotional uh, is a natural reaction to events that occur in your life, most of which we recover from. Clinical is where a number of factors are in play for a period of time, untreated, will probably continue to grow in terms of their severity. Everyone has down days. It's pretty easy to feel down today when, you've, when you're overwhelmed with certain things or you feel you can't get on top of things. It's when it starts to affect your thinking ability and physical symptoms. When you start to get that occurring and lasting for more than about two weeks, that's when you really do need to be seeing someone sooner rather than later. I've come to the conclusion that the more material assets we have in life, the more uh, we tend to allow uh, expectations of ourselves, expectations that are put on us, to influence the way we feel. In other words, I recently walked the Kokoda track again in Papua New Guinea. And what always impresses me is meeting the indigenous people along the way who have no phones, no cars, no telephones, no TVs. Uh, they live a very simple but proud life. Their villages are clean, but they're all happy. They're all happy. There's no depression up there. They're happy. Come back here to Australia. We've got all these wonderments and ingredients that go into our lives, and yet we've got this very high... Uh, depressive illness rate, we have a very high suicide rate. Why? Because of expectation, because of material things. I've, I've probably spoken to literally hundreds of parents now and every time there is this reoccurring theme about if only I had known and there wouldn't be a parent I've ever spoken to that would have known. They just didn't know. And there's this blame and guilt and self-hate often and a sense of regret and failure. And that is a really deep emotional package to have to live with for the rest of your life. Um, and as a parent of a child that has attempted as well, it is one of the most heart-wrenching experiences that you ever go through. And my heart bleeds every time I speak to a parent regarding losing a child that way. It's horrendous. You've been quoted recently as saying that the, the carers of the depressed need to maintain what you call a, a sense of disconnection. What did you actually mean by that? When you're caring for someone with um, quite a severe mental illness, it's not a short-term head cold. Often for some families, some friends, some partners, siblings and children who care for people um, who have got a, a mental health condition, it's a lifetime commitment. And there are often behaviours, there are often ways that people will act towards you that don't feel loving. And it's, it's a case of, I have got to see the illness and then I've got to know that the person exists still inside that illness. And that when they're well again and they're symptom free from the illness, I will have them back. So I can't necessarily disregard the whole package of the person because at the core, the person you love is still there. You have to live with the symptoms of the behaviours at times. A lot of the research and the evidence around conversations about suicide are more geared towards having direct conversations. The, the premise to that is that you feel that you can have that type of conversation. It'll be one of the hardest things that will ever, ever have to come out of your mouth if it's a child or it's a partner or it's someone very dear to you in your life, having to say to them, I worry and I care about you and I'm gonna ask you some, some questions and I need you to tell me the honest truth about how you're feeling. And one of my questions is, are you or have you ever considered self-harming or suicide? And many GPs ask that quite regularly in a mental health review. And we as family and friends need to be able to ask that question and know how to stay safe with that person if they were to say yes to you. So you're winning the battle 
what do you really need to win the war, do you think? Uh, I'd like it to, to win the war, I think we need to wave a magic wand and end discrimination. To win the war, I think we need to change in part the way we live our lives. Uh, it's not always about the next dollar. It's not always about the size of your house or the colour or size of your car. Uh, life isn't just for working to prove yourself better than the next person. You work for, for, for fulfilment, to be able to deliver and provide, but there's got to be another side of life.